as it's preparing. And then we go over to Facebook. I did find, so I don't know if we might be live, it's possible. Um, <laughs> let's see. So yesterday I did a lovely live with uh, somebody called Tanya uh, on, on a different page, uh, also autistic. And um, they use a completely different streaming thing and it was really, really clever. So I might look into that. Mm. Ah, yes, there we go, we're over there. Awesome. So hello, lovely people. Um, we're just gonna let the room fill up and particularly as we're not usually here on a Friday. So, oh, hello, Austin. Oh, you eager beavers, lovely. Um, we'll do like we usually do, proper introductions in a bit. So I'm just going to be here just for a second or so uh, to see if it's worth sharing to other other places. Well, it is. What I mean is trying to work out, can I share it? Oh, I can share it to Twitter. Interesting. Ooh, let's see if we can do that. Ooh. I've not done that before. Uh, me with Sonia. Sorry, I need like intro music. <laughs> Are you tweeting us? I am, which I, I should have been doing this the whole time. I'm so not tech wow. savvy. Well, you can just send a tweet out and it's a, a link to where we are or... Or, I don't know if it's actually playing over there. I have no idea. So, you know, Ooh. we'll see, see how that goes. I'm um, 24 people here already. You lovely people oh, lovely. on a Friday night. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, and I just want to double double check that this goes to our arts group um, because this will be really, really a uh, good one for them to see. So let's have a look. Where's the arts group? Too many groups, too many groups to find it. Let's have a look. Academy of Arts, lovely. There we go. Sorry, people who are here, we will do proper introductions. <laughs> I do. I, if anyone wants to make a jingle, like a jingle music for Academy while we're just sort of hanging around for people to like turn up and me sort out my life at this end. Um, oh, share to arts group. Thank you, Kelly. That's fantastic. Thank you, everybody. OK, 33 of you, you wonderful people. Um, given that, it, like I say, it's it's not a typical thing for a Friday night for Academy. So hello, everybody. Um, I am Dr. Chloe Farahar of Academy. Um, and as you're already here, you must know what Academy is by now. Um, we're an educative platform for autistic people educating about anything relating to autistic people and their interests. And I'm joined by Sonia. Um, please pronounce your surname for me so I don't butcher it. <laughs> Sonia Bue. Bue, okay. Yeah, Bue. I think I pronounce too much of the E then when I do it, probably. Bue. Had, Bue. That's okay. okay. <laughs> Bue is fine too. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so lovely. And for some of you who might not have seen Sonia on here before, um, we did have something on last year. We did a lovely, it was a really lovely session, actually. I enjoyed that one a lot. Um, so we did a, an autistic artist session last year with um, yourself, Annette Foster and Callum Bratzo, um, which I quite enjoyed because we talked about neurodivergent aesthetic um, and things like that, which we might touch on today um, because I think that comes up a lot in what we're going to be discussing, doesn't it? I think, is that fair to say? Definitely, yeah. definitely. Okay, so everybody who's here, lovely, we're going to do, do some proper intros as we um, tend to do. So I'm going to, although I know Sonia, um, ask Sonia, who are you and what are your dedicated interests So the things that you're interested Ooh. in? Okay, so I am, as we said, Sonia Bua. Um, I'm a visual artist and um, I'm also um, somebody who writes a, a sort of blog quite a lot about autism and the arts, and um, I also work with arts organisations um, as a consultant around support for neurodivergent creatives. And, and my oh, dedicated interests at the moment, because this does fluctuate, so um, I guess collage. And I liked having a conversation with you. So if you don't know Sonia's work, we probably will show some screen um, sharing in a bit and have a look at 
like the Instagram page and things like that. And I, I think I was having a conversation with some other autistic people recently about this, which is not just things like art, but all sorts of things that can can be relatively abstract or something along those lines, um, including jokes. I like people to explain those things and for me to understand them better. So when, for instance, you explained to me, I think it was just you and I having a conversation about it, which is your real fascination with noses in the past year. And seeing your work, I didn't get it. And I know that sounds really horrible because but I'm not an artist <laughs> either. So I'm, you know, I do apologize that that sounds awful because you're not supposed to sort of ask, I guess, about people's why, <laughs> what does that mean? And why did you do it? But when you explained, I was like, I could really appreciate your work a lot more with that understanding that helped me kind of mm -hmm. get it. Is that like sacrilege when it comes to art? <laughs> no, no, not at all. I think um, as a visual artist, you, you're just putting stuff out there and hoping that people get it, at what, you know, they receive it at the point that they are at. So, you know, you can't really dictate to somebody what they're going to get from a piece of work. It's sort of, it's quite interesting. You sort of make it and um, have this sort of intense relationship with it quite often. And you just put it out there, you know, it's a punt, really. And obviously, we tend to, you know, if you're putting more formal work out there, you tend to sort of describe it or have some kind of, you know, label on it so that people can get more out of it. Um, but I, I often do really enjoy finding out more about an artist's intention. I think it can enrich the experience, but it's not, you know, it, it, I think sometimes it either speaks to you or it doesn't. Like that, yeah. So this, and this is the thing. So there's sometimes when art confuses me and I'm not too sure, I do like to kind of, if, if the artist is able, obviously they might not be wanting to explain what they were thinking or what it meant or anything like that. And like you say, it might be, well, for, for the receiver to just accept it at, at what point they're receiving it, did you say? How did you word it? Mm -hmm. I don't think I worded it very well, but I suppose um, what I mean is wherever, you, wherever you're at in your life and whatever your life experiences might be, you're going to read into a piece of work from that life experience. You're going to either be attracted to it because it speaks to you in some way of something you recognise or something that makes sense to you, or you're going to think, oh, I don't really know what that's about. And either it'll intrigue you and you'll want to know more or you'll just say, and I'm actually not that interested in, in finding out. So it's kind of like, you know. Yeah, I, uh, I don't I, know. I, yeah, I don't know whether there's other people in the comment section, for instance, who if you don't necessarily can just consider yourself an artist, which I, I don't consider myself an artist. Um, and but as an autistic person, just wanting to know and to understand and pick things apart, I guess, is is part of that. I've gone off on a tangent because I didn't even get to ask my second question, which is um, um, fine. <laughs> when were you discovered autistic? Just we like these background oh, things before we talk. When about... was I discovered autistic? I think so. This is before any formal event, shall we say. I think I was discovered autistic through a video that I made of a performance by an autistic friend. So I think that probably happened in about 2014, way before my formal, shall we say, discovery in 2016. So I shared what I thought was an art performance um, online and my autistic friend said to me I see autism and I thought how cute they, they want you know this person we're so close we, we have this great friendship and they want me to be autistic and that's lovely but I didn't I, I wasn't aware at that point so is that a discovery or not that's somebody else discovering isn't it it's still discovery isn't it yeah so I guess it's the <laughs> Because we, we, I mean, you know, so many different autistic people, I, I meet so many different people and their, their sort of origin stories, if you like, of figuring it out are, are quite varied. Like some people have literally been told, like I say, by other people, you know, you're autistic. Have you not realised? Yeah, know, we've, yeah. We've, we've got 
Tigger now, who's who's part and parcel now of Academy, and um, he only worked it out last year, and he's he's slightly older, and um, uh, you know he's been working with autistic people for years, absolutely, you know, the majority of his adult life. Um, when I was sort of introduced to him, in, I went to the other person. He's autistic, right? And they were like, "Well, yeah, but he doesn't really know it." And you know, so it's been very, it's very interesting when people, yeah, it's, in, it's sort of intriguing. Drawn. It's it's intriguing, isn't it? And I was, we may have been gone off topic slightly. I don't know, but I'm enjoying it. So should we just carry on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally was thinking about this earlier on, either today or yesterday, which is. Um, so a close friend of mine is in the process of discovering that autism. And you sort of think back to your own journey, I think, when a close friend is going through that as well. And um, I was thinking, yeah, it's like a sort of, it's almost like a, an, a, a cultural thing, a cultural perception that, of course, autism was always there, but you didn't know how to recognize it, even if you had close contact with other autistic people. And I don't know why that is, but it, it is a definitely a thing that sometimes you don't relate it to yourself. It seems it seems something separate. Yeah, and I think that, that, that interests me. And then once you cross that line and you start to realize more deeply what it might mean in your case, then it sort of becomes much more obvious but it does feel like a kind of transition almost and I think some of that sadly is because of the stereotypes as well so it's kind of you know yeah. and I did the exact same thing you know my partner was autistic with attention differences I did psychology all these kinds of things I it did not twig and I was kind of like but I don't do that thing and I don't do that thing and exactly it's that kind of yeah and, yeah. and this yeah. again is why all I talk about at the moment is the importance of autistic identity, culture, community, and space. Because like you said, if you, you need to sort of understand that culture and then you can connect with it and, and so on. This is why I keep saying, you know, we need to move away from pathology and, and think of it about in the same way that you recognize your gender, recognize your sexual identity, those kinds of things, or come to learn and discover those things. Mm. Um, definitely gone off on a a random beautiful topic. <laughs> although, although it does totally relate to the project that we will be talking about, which is really a cultural project about identity. So it's perfect, really. This is true. <laughs> okay, let's do that then. Okay. So um, um I mean, as as much as possible, what is the project? So what is it that we're sort of talking about today? Okay, so the project is called neurophototherapy and it draws on um, something called phototherapy which um, I came across not really as a therapeutic tool but as an art practice so I've discovered an artist called Joe Spence who's absolutely amazing who used phototherapy personally for herself in her own journey as somebody who had a major health issue and needed to work through that um, and also work through lots of family dynamics. But she was a visual artist. She was a photographic artist um, who began as a commercial artist, but then went on to develop an artistic practice. And um, so I've sort of borrowed Jo Spencer's um, kind of not not really I sort of adapted um her work sort of which is really sort of iconically amazing it's beautiful photographic work um which is very autobiographical as you might imagine so neurophototherapy draws on that really that experience of encountering this work um and realizing that I was actually doing something very similar in my own art practice without realizing in relation to my neurodivergence. So hence neurophototherapy. And what's interesting about the Jo Spence story is that her phototherapy um, practice really developed out of a co-counseling friendship and relationship. And um, I sort of adapted neurophototherapy for autistic people. You could do it with somebody else 
but it is something you can do on your own. And the primary relationship really is with the camera, with yourself and with your identity. And the idea is that you are in control of every element of your creative process around using photography to uncover identity. So that's, that's sort of the roots of it. And when I say I was doing something very similar, what had happened is during the lockdown, I couldn't go to my studio. So I'm a multi-form artist. I paint, I make films, I take photographs, um, you know, I, I work with objects, I do all kinds of things. Um, and I was quite studio based. And then lockdown came and I was stuck at home with my camera. So I had me and my camera and I started to develop this autobiographical uh, documenting myself during the lockdown. And that was when the noses started appearing and just to explain to, <laughs> to people who were watching. Um, Shall I find lockdown. one of the noses? Hold on. Oh, go on, go on, show them a nose. <laughs> um, so I think, I think it was around about the time of um, political happenings around um, Dominic Cummings' trip to Barnard Castle, that I began to use um, noses in quite a satirical way in some of the photography that I was making. Um, and that is actually a very different photograph, but, um, and that's now using more collage techniques. But the, but the earlier photographs using noses were very much sort of feeling like I needed to express this kind of, um, you know, frustration with being lied to. And it was this whole idea of the Pinocchio nose and um, kind of like, you know, just, just feeling really frustrated and quite wordless. I think lockdown made me feel very wordless. It really brought out, you know, a lot of my, oh, there we go. There are the Pinocchio noses. It really brought out the kind of challenges that I have sometimes when I am overwhelmed and I become wordless. And um, the noses started to enable me to kind of like just articulate how I was feeling and to feel like I was getting some of my power back in making social commentary really. And it was lovely because people kind of joined in. <laughs> some people even sent me pictures of themselves with noses. Uh, people commented and it was like, it, it began a conversation. And um, it was, when I discovered the work of Joe Spence and I saw some really striking similarities with some of our photographs that I began to realize what I was doing that actually this was enabling me as an autistic person to have conversations with people and to connect and I was connecting more authentically than I was able to connect with words or without playful props and disguises and so I guess neurophototherapy emerged out of lockdown and this, so there was actually an exhibition of Joe Spence's work, um, which was online during lockdown as well, which is how this coincidence happened that I, I sort of, it, it all started to come together in my mind. And then the other thing that happened was that I started, as we do, to connect all the other aspects of my life to this. And, and, and think about the other autistic um, women that I know who are struggling with identity and not being able to unmask and sort of mental health issues around, um, you know, this terrible difficulty of how to be authentic in a, in a very hostile, um, you know, neuronormative world. Um, and so this is an Arts Council funded research and development project and my um, bid to Arts Council England was to create a model that might be usable by other neurodivergent creatives. And so what I'm actually doing now is I'm making a series of photographs. I've made a whole bunch of collage as you can see on the um, Instagram account. And I will be um, narrating my life story from a neurodivergent perspective. So I'm taking control of my narrative and I'm rewriting it, which I think is a very powerful thing to do. 
and I'll also be sharing um, the process that I've been going through and all the techniques that I've been using with collage and um, creating a kind of a workbook for other people to use if they'd like to. And then because this is research and development, the follow on stage would be going forward with a group of participants to make work together and have an exhibition of, of, of works. And so the underlying, oh, sorry, I'm going on and on, Chloe, you can interrupt if you want. But no, no, it's fine, because it's explaining it, yeah. <laughs> the underlying idea is that late, so it's for late diagnosed people, late diagnosis um, means that you've gone through life misidentified. I'm being active about this now in my thinking about it. I'm finding that people are traumatized by being misidentified as neurotypical people and that's how I'm talking about it and so we have trauma that we need to work through um, and um, there's very little mental health support as we all know so I'm identifying this need um, and also the idea that you can self-recover through lots of different strategies as I know a lot of your work is around this as well Zoe um, I and don't want to stop your flow, but I'm just, yeah. can I, because I'm just picking yeah, up on what it, you said quite yeah. early on, which was that I think what's quite interesting is you're talking about it as very much something you can do by yourself. Um, and so, so I guess talking about that would be really interesting. So I obviously get an idea why that's important, but why is that important? Why does this particular method that you're trying to you know support other autistic uh later discovered women at this point in time i'm saying late discovered women and marginalized genders i'm now extending it because i feel uncomfortable with just saying women lovely yeah yeah so so why is that important then that idea of doing that by yourself i think because um we are we we tend to be autodidacts, which means that we tend to teach ourselves methods. Um, we tend to um, need space and time on our own to process. Um, I think we like to take charge of our own process. And I think also um, part of my thinking was around um, can, the isolation of some autistic people. Um, so they might need a method that they can use on their own. They might not have a group of people they can um, rely on to, you know, co-counsel or, 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 or be part of a network. Um, also that lockdown, you know, if, if lockdowns yeah. continued, this would be something you can do at home. You can use very humble materials. You know, at one point I was doing things like grabbing broccoli out of the fridge and using broccoli as a nose. You know, it's kind of, it's very bound up with the domestic and spaces that you feel safe in. And it's this idea. So I've, I've sort of, I've unpicked it. I've worked out what it is that I'm doing and I'm safely unmasking and playfully unmasking and I'm building identities. And so the idea is that if you want to share it, you can. If you want to do a group uh, activity, you can, but if you need to do some of this work on your own, then it's perfect. Um, and because I had to do it on my own, because we were in lockdown, that's kind of how it, how it evolved. But I think I've always, I've always done this and it, it's got very deep roots in my own practice because um, I've taught myself a lot of these um, multi forms that I use. You know, I didn't go to art college. I've taught myself to do most things that I have to do as a professional artist. And I just think it, um, I think that's an, quite natural for a lot of um, neurodivergent people that we actually and almost prefer to learn in our yeah. own way. And then if you want the help to somebody to explain something, then yeah. it's nice if that there's somebody there to do that. But I would agree, actually, that not all of us, but yeah, a no. large number of us no. might prefer those sorts of, like I say, we, we do a lot of self-exploration, yeah. a lot of research 
on understanding ourselves yeah and I think also because it because it could be quite deep work as well I mean I, I the the one thing I really do want to say is I'm not touting it as, a, as something that's going to enable you to recover full stop from trauma I'm saying it I'm putting it there as part of a patchwork of strategies that we might have to use so it's 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 just another thing that you might happen upon that might be beneficial and helpful to you um but i think yes. also because 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 it might be quite you know some some people might feel really hesitant to show themselves in front of anybody else so how do you begin that journey maybe you have to begin it on on your own and then maybe you can be part of a group or maybe a couple yeah, of so some maybe like a process of building up your yeah. confidence to share yeah. your inner world because yeah. like you say particularly if you are late discovered um you know whatever gender um you know there are so many late discovered people of all genders mm. and largely i would argue the reason they are late discovered well there's a couple of reasons one is potentially that they don't have like a language impairment which makes them hard to spot because they can use typical communication language to some extent in quotation marks um but also it's the mask you know and and all genders of can course. do that of course so yeah like that sounds like an interesting process like you say to have that investigate that by yourself because actually I really did you know before we we all do it we all do it in different ways so maybe yours would be just that more creative capturing of that person's identity than me writing 13 pages of why I think I'm autistic <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about more creative but I suppose what to explain some of the method um so so how I how I also came about this is I think it's a little bit like life journaling or a little bit of life reviewing because I feel that um, what happens quite often to us is we're late diagnosed, we've gone through our lives so far, you discover yourself in whatever way, and for me it was with an official um, diagnosis, and then you have to look back and think, well, nothing is what I thought it was. And I think what happens is that there's no real acknowledgement of that in clinical practice, in the medical world. You're just sort of discovered and, and left. Left to it. And I think it's this, for me, it's this overwhelming feeling of needing to look back and make sense of it all. And that's kind of what my project does through photography. So I use a lot of childhood photos. And I was um, going to pick up on that. I don't want to ruin yeah. your train of thought. So no, I'll... no, no, go, go for it. Go for well, it. I was going to pick up on that because it started making me think, and this is obviously, uh, if, if you're relatively new to understanding that you're autistic, um, when we empathise as autistic people, it's to say, oh yeah, I did that thing and this is what it was, um, which can, to some people, look like you're making it about you. Um, and I apologise um, if that comes across to anyone. Um, I know you'll get it, so that's fine. But it made me start to think about because I've seen, like you say, you sort of working with your younger pictures when you were younger. And because I think to myself, yeah, I just did the writing and I just did this discovery with other autistic people. But actually, a lot of the training that I do, it depends on, on who's asking for what type of training. But I have a growing up autistic section if they want that. And actually what that is, is a number of photos of me when I was young going well that's a masked smile that's not a real smile that was a very anxious child you can't see that though and and actually I think I am doing something but in a very sort of I'm comfortable with the powerpoint kind of way <laughs> yeah. you know so it's me saying I didn't know I was, I was autistic but look how obvious it was look at the stimming pictures of me and this yeah. is very this is very similar so the thing that struck me was looking at photos of my and these and some of these were photos that I'd never seen before so it actually struck me most when um I was at my at my old family home and we've got this really old projector and I got it out from under the sofa and um started looking at some slides that haven't really been taken out of a box for you know donkey's years and suddenly all these 
slides which had not been developed into photographs. So they were the kind of, I suppose they were the rejects, they were the ones that, you know, didn't make it through the, through the edit. Um, and I'm just a blur, you know, I'm tiny, I'm literally a toddler. And you don't see me in any of those photos uh, hardly because I'm moving so much. And then when I'm standing still, I'm kind of like, you know, I can't hold my body up. I've got loose ligaments, you know, or I'm kind of going like that because I don't want somebody to touch me or, you know, and there's all this hidden. So that it, it's, it's really interesting. It's like the photos where you're masking <laughs> get through. Uh, you know, th those were the yeah. ones that my dad decided to develop. And then the ones where I was a blur, he probably just thought, well, there's no point in developing that. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it's, it's, it sounds very similar. And I was actually quite excited by that, because although I dislike this idea that you can see autism, you know, that you look autistic, you can see yourself as your authentic self when you look at photos of you as a and child I that think... aren't... That, 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 that aren't the school photos, that yeah. aren't the posed photos. And, and I think I definitely, as an autistic person, we can spot other autistic people. So that whole thing of you don't or you do look autistic, I think is far more acceptable in our community because we don't mean it in a sort of you're not doing the stereotype. Yeah, autistic. you're not flapping, you're not jumping that up and down, flapping, yeah. making noises. Yeah. But I definitely yeah. think we can we can go, oh, I can see an autistic person there, you know, and there's no negative connotation. If anything, it's like, yay, new autistic friend, um, yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> so, yeah, I definitely think we can look autistic in the sense of connecting with another autistic person and recognising that. As opposed yeah, to there's that one there's negative. one amazing amazing photo which i haven't used because i don't know i don't have permissions to use it for the other children in the photo but it's absolutely classic so it's a bonfire night and i remember them well i grew up on this estate and we used to have you know a communal bonfire night and all the kids in the area just used to hang out and there's a group of like five girls or so six girls and I'm sort of you know second to the end and one of them's got this whacking great candle that she's managed to get from somewhere that's lit up and there all the other girls have kind of got their arms draped around each other smiling at the camera or at least looking at the camera they know what they're supposed to be doing I'm looking at the candle I'm looking mesmerized by the flame you know and it's just things like that that you just think well you know I think there it, it I mean this might be another <laughs> another day just me and you were having a conversation I might show you just some of those photos that like say the ones that I sh show to us they were just typical photos but actually when you look at them there's one that I show where my sister's got a load of um, she's about I think she's mm, I can't think how old she is but she's got all her Shaun the Sheep things for her birthday and everything Sean the sheep absolutely everything and they're all stacked up on her bed really tidy because that's how you play right you stack those things up you don't play with of them of course right of course and then you can <laughs> and so it's those kinds of things that are quite clearly autistic um you know dedication to your interest which was for her Sean the sheep and it's some of it was just so obvious as well and that's something I talk about which is the the we shouldn't really have been missed. We were quite clearly autistic in a lot of our stims and all that kind of thing. Um, I just, because um, it, it will lose the train of thought otherwise. Yeah. I've just yeah, pinned yeah. a comment from somebody which was just saying, this was the saddest thing for me growing up, having autistic empathy and communication and then being told that I don't care or that I'm being self-centered emotionally. Oh, that must've been from me saying, we empathize by saying, oh yeah, I experienced that and yes. this is what it was yeah um, emotionally I was wrecked because I do care so very much I'm glad you say that out loud to preface uh what I said um and that they do that now too it's advocacy and educational um yeah lovely and there was something else um I wanted to grab as well um mostly people are just chatting to each other about the art they like and um what oh, they good. do and things like that <laughs> Um, where was it? There was somebody who said, do, 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 do. 
yeah so somebody else as well oh asha so lovely um said that um he likes looking at childhood photos um oh sorry finds looking at childhood photos really helpful for working through things so yeah so you've definitely got some people that's interesting understanding that's that. interesting yeah i mean i just i just and i suppose when i said collage is my dedicated interest at the moment it really goes hand in hand with photography and photographs because it's really photo collage that i'm particularly um dedicated to at the moment and um i'm just obsessed with photos i've always been obsessed with family photos in particular um but i do collect photos of other people <laughs> i went through this phase of collecting um what i felt were like abandoned photos of you know children that made me feel really kind of like protective of them and wanting to <laughs> to bring them home so i've got a whole album of um photos of of other children you know um and it's this thing that's my way of showing empathy as well. Yeah, you know, that you don't want necessarily... them to get lost. Yeah, and I feel it's like it's really sad. Oh my God, they've got separated from their family. There's nobody to care for them or look at those photos anymore. And I really cherish them, you know. Yeah, and um, I think it doesn't necessarily, not all of us again, but um, I've always had a thing about the physical photos. Uh, I can't remember if I've Me mentioned too. this to you before, but I always wanted to have double of every photo and then one copy would be the ones you were allowed to look at and then the other copy would be in like a bomb proof waterproof safe so that I never wow. lost I was just so attached to those physical even though I'm a very visual thinker and I've got such early memories um even when you were talking and I was thinking about you know oh yeah the photos from when I was young and you know I could see all the sorts of um childhood experiences that I was thinking about at the time but it's just that something about those physical photos and the idea of losing them was really distressing to me in my 20s this was you know I didn't want to lose those and now mm -hmm. everything's digital and it's everywhere um kind of thing so do you, got have, a, do you have lots of lots of memory sticks and external hard drives and I have a terabyte or? hard drive okay. <laughs> that sits down here that I can update <laughs> um upload things to and yeah it's interesting isn't it with photos in general I think are such a fascinating they're, 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 they're very powerful and I think it, it feels to me like magic so that's the other thing is I think it is quite stimmy using a digital camera I don't use my iPhone for photographs I use um a DSLR um, camera and I use it on a timer so I time myself, um, uh, you know, I, I photograph myself with the timer. I don't time myself. And I have the, um, so I've got like a, a screen that turns around so you can see yourself, you can see the photo that's been taken and I get 10 shots per, you know, I set it up and I get 10 shots. And then I sort of like can change where I am in front of the camera, depending on what I see fed back to me from the, you know, from the little screen. And I just find it really exciting. And then the fact that it's like magic, then the fact that it can just go straight to your computer and then you can edit it. And it's like, oh my goodness. I've now gone yeah. off on a weird tangent in my head. because I'm also <laughs> thinking the first proper job that, I, I mean, I worked for, I always do this and then Si always jokes, makes la uh, uh, some laughs and comments and things in the um, <laughs> comment section because I never state the name of the company. It's a very big, uh, sort of um pharmaceutical and um you know beauty products sort of chain that everybody's okay. probably know aware yes. of um i worked for them about 14 years on and off um terrible to work in customer service when you're autistic um, and particularly when you don't know it but the very first role that i had with them when i was 17 was working in the photo lab and the photo lab i loved it because it was back then when you had 35 mils. And so that was proper, um, you know, developing them, playing around with the photos. And I think what was, we've kind of lost because of obviously with, you, there's so many pros and cons, isn't there? Because we've got so many amazing things you can now do because of digital. But I like the fact that, you know, you really didn't know whether it's going to be a good photo until you, you know, developed the, the film. Um, and that kind of, you know, that kind of love of 
photography and and what might come out and like you said some of them might have been really blurred and <laughs> I love really bad photos I've got I've got one of my favorite photos is Christmas dinner and I'm sitting with my mum and we're sitting quite far apart and the person that's taken the photo is either my sister or my dad has taken the photo of the middle and we're kind of on the edge <laughs> <laughs> and we've got these you know like hats out of a cracker on and we're having a, a grand old time but it's just like it's just really you know it's really off in terms of the you know the composition I love it I might have to I show you it's so my old photos yeah you might enjoy yeah. it <laughs> I've got, <laughs> I think I've got I would. a random album that's even got things like me and my sister used to like um, so we're about 18 months apart so we were quite we were really very close as children we didn't really get on with other children they didn't understand us and um I've got whole reams of photos of where we would make up little shows and things and so it's us taking a photo of like the show as it were like a little toy and it's moving and then the next shot and yeah just really I've gone off on such a random tangent no you haven't ideas, and you're, you're helping me you're helping me say one of the things which I think is really helpful about this particular method uh, and I go back to this idea of you're doing it you're in control you're getting this feedback from a if, if you do it the way I'm doing it it would it would be the same actually with with um, a smartphone because you can turn them around can't you and you can see yourself which is how I've learned to do most things is by on screen is actually being able to having the camera that way around and actually being able to see myself and keep myself going with that feedback loop um, that visual well, like feedback say, loop and it, it, so it's this part of this identity and it's all just like connecting with yourself it's connecting with yourself yes that's why I think somebody else might get in the way or could yeah. potentially and it's like it would put me off if I felt I had to do something in front of somebody I'd get totally put off my stroke whereas if I'm on my own in my own space I can keep the flow going and then the other thing so that's one thing but then the other thing you, you've made me think about these little shows that you used to make and for me this whole practice also involves dressing up it is quite it's got its roots in the idea of performance I call it performative photography and it does have its roots in the theater, which is kind of like my background from my father's side of the family. Um, and also it's this thing that the camera is still, and I'm incredibly dyspraxic. If I had to perform in front of people, I have to make all kinds of accommodations for myself in order to be able to do it. And it's really stressful because I don't know if I can hold it together all the way through or if something's going to go wrong something could happen whereas with this method you're still you, you can be still the camera is still I have it on a tripod and the dyspraxia angle becomes irrelevant it doesn't become a stress or a or a hazard to me and also surely if you do sort of jolt or you know but you still take the picture that to me is, is kind of beautiful because it's it is. like you say it's showing demonstrating that neurodivergence and multiple neurodivergence so now I'm thinking back to what you said about the blurred pictures of you as a child kind of thing like you you would just re, be recreating that naturally I find that that's really interesting I find that yeah and I think actually so I do have a tendency because I'm very perfectionist surprise surprise I do have a tendency to try and create very composed images and actually the images that I'm making for the for the art side of this project so I'm going to explain in a minute there's two different strands to the project but the art outcomes as we call them um, are will be quite composed photographs will be quite um, you know everything really is about harmony and balance and creating something that's pleasing and still it's a bit like my Tupperware cupboard it's got to be perfect <laughs> or I feel I don't feel right so the images have to be perfect or I don't feel right about them and um, so that's the kind of art outcome for the project there will be sort of like an online exhibition of works but then there's also a messy area of the project which is more like a workbook more like a guide 
and we, where I'll share all the process side of things, which is kind of like more about um, the actual way that I've made some of the collages that I've been making and, and sharing I... techniques and that yeah, kind of thing. Sorry, am I going to cut off your flow? Are you gonna... Well, just to, just to say that you're inspiring me to think actually that what I need to do is the next series will be blurred images, recreating those blurred images and less about the perfection. I think you picked up on something quite quite interesting there. All, I, all it made me think of as well, because you're talking about, you know, you've got that sort of finished product, if you like, but the process part, um, it's not quite the same. And, and again, because my background really isn't, um, you know, it's not art or performance art or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, but when I was looking into, you know, um, theatre for change and things like that, um, I would I kept arguing that what I was doing with my script and the play for people, it was about the um, the actor and the process of perform, you know, of rehearsing for a performance, not the product and the audience kind of thing. And it that's where all of it all the sort of inner change came from it comes from that messy process yeah kind of yeah. thing which I find really I find that much more interesting as well than it is nice to see the finished product and if you're the person who's kind of doing the process obviously if you're going through neurophototherapy and so on you do need a goal at the end of it otherwise to some extent it feels a little bit frustrating so whether that's whether you don't display that, whether you, it's just you create something for yourself. It may be, it, yeah, I mean, there's lots of different outcomes it could be. So for me, it's, a, it's going to be an online exhibition and a workbook where I share, you know, my, the messy side of it and the process and the house too. Um, but it could just be that you have, there's lots of different little pieces that I've made throughout the project. So it could just be that you create something and that that's the completion, that you bring a piece of work together um, that's on a smaller scale that you keep in your home that is precious to you, that resonates with you. Because it's about, so this is interesting, isn't it? Because we're really talking about authenticity and genuine support alongside something that is also about creating something that is a bit more on the professional side of of art practice which I think we're probably touching on the whole neurodivergent aesthetic I've literally <laughs> made a note for us to come back to which is the trauma of the art world and the impact on neurodivergent artists um so I think I've left I've made that note because as you were talking I was like we need to talk about this um so we can definitely come back to that we do, and I want to flag one little thing up, which is um, the other element of the project, which we haven't touched on yet, but I think it relates to this other question, is that I've invited you and um, uh, Professor Nicola Shaughnessy and Dr. Joy Leong, Dawn okay. Joy Leong, sorry, okay. Dawn Joy Leong. I think you probably do know of her. Um, He's a very wonderful autistic artist and advocate in Singapore, based in Singapore. Um, and she, she was um, Professor Shaughnessy's doctoral student a little while back. Um, so I've invited the three of you to write about my work, haven't I? And I've invited you to write about neurophototherapy. Um, which is going to be um, very interesting from my, you know. It's going to be great. Well, it's, I mean, to some extent, that's kind of nice because I don't really know or, you know, it's not like I'm going to be able to critique the art kind of thing. It's it's much more yeah. about what is it you've done and, yeah, so that's exactly. sort of it's, neurodivergent. It's reflecting, reflecting from, from your perspective. Um, but this is, so the reason I'm doing this and perhaps to... Um, tune people in as well to the fact this is the first time I've worked with my neurodivergence in my art practice so yes I was discovered autistic let's say 2015 to 2016 a bit of a journey there for me um, at which point I was not making work about my neurodivergence at all I was doing something completely different um, and so it's taken me all this time to get around to 
to doing this work for myself. And I really think it's been the lockdown and also working on the Playing a Part project that has made this come about. Um, I don't want to take us on a tangent with the Playing a Part project. Okay. But <laughs> but um, so I'll, I'll lose the thread. But anyway, perhaps we can explain to people what that is in 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 a minute. I'll put a note. Um, yeah. But um, so the undercarriage of this is that what I want to do with this project, as well as support women, as well as flag up that there is a need, as well as um, you know work through this model and create the work. I also want to frame what I'm doing as neurodivergent creativity, because certainly, and aesthetics, certainly in the art world, there's a complete lack of understanding about what that is. And um, that will feed into the question of people who are neurodivergent quite often finding art college traumatic. Yeah, and, and that's what we had as a big conversation. I think we ended up talking for about two hours, which was um, <laughs> just, it was meant to be just a sort of, we've got, I've got this idea and can I just run this past <laughs> you? And then it was like two hours later, just talking about this. Um, so there's a couple of things actually. So what, and um, what I find interesting is how you sort of phrased the fact that this is the first time you're bringing your neurodivergence into your art. And I guess, is it fair to say, when you say that you mean consciously and that it's about neurodivergence because this is so when I when we had that long conversation before the reason I came back to you after you'd already mentioned about the project was um, we've got our own academy arts group and um, during one of the academy socials so there's a number of groups during one of the socials um, that I had some spoons and I managed to attend I don't tend to attend them sadly because I don't have a lot of energy um, and I, I was listening and there was three, I don't want to misgender anyone. So there were three autistic people in that group who one started talking about their art and how they've only been recently discovered. So the, the majority of the people in that group are, are sort of later discovered autistic people. Um, so this person was explaining how traumatized they've been by, you know, um, art college or art, going to do um, art at university or something along those lines and about how, their aesthetic the things that they found beautiful the colors they were talking about they were bringing in the colors from the rugrats was mm -hmm. not the rugrats itself but the theme and the colors of that cartoon if anyone remembers that cartoon from sort of the 90s um and they were just being ripped to shreds for their aesthetic but that was their autistic neurodivergent aesthetic being part and parcel of their art does that make sense so while you're you've said this is the first time you've brought your neurodivergence it's is it fair to say you mean as in you're making it clear that it's about neurodivergence where because surely yes. all your art would have been neurodivergent yes 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 <laughs> absolutely so sorry I didn't make that clear what I should have added was as a subject so I'm I and also I'm unmasking as a professional I mean I've unmasked as a professional person in my advocacy and this actually was causing a problem for me that I had not unmasked in my practice. There were these two separate parts of what I was doing and I was um, very known for my advocacy. And um, I was struggling because I had these two different sort of environments um, that I had to kind of navigate. One where, you know, the, the autism seemed irrelevant. <laughs> You know, and how, how could that be? You know, that just doesn't, that doesn't work for me. Uh, and I think the more that you unmask and the more that you become aware of what you need to do to support yourself, the less you can cope with incongruences and, and things which are not helpful to you. So it's sort of, yeah, and lockdown kind of speeded that along. So it's sort of, it's not that I'm letting go of the subject matter that I was working on before either. So I'm, continue to work in that area um, but that I've had to sort of make a, a swerve if you like and say okay now and I can remember some some people saying to me well are you sure you want to do that isn't that like career suicide why are you doing that and you know it's just not it's it for me it's not about that I just have to be myself otherwise what's the point you know yeah. um, 
so well I'm, I'm in, so, I mean yeah. yeah the reason that I ended up having that conversation with you because I was like you know is it possible even if they can't be part of this particular project because like I say it's going to be a small group of people mm. even if at some point you can just chat to that particular group because it was really it was really to. quite heartbreaking which is why I came mm. to because I was like this was really heartbreaking can we you know is there some way we can support these people to just because because the, 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 those three people that I'm thinking of they do now share their art in the arts group and I'm so pleased I'm not saying you know we didn't have any hand in that but it's just a space mm. that they can feel safe that the people on the receiving end are going to go or be honest and be like that's lovely I like this you know and, and just have that mm. sort of honesty which is nice but I'd say mm. it was really heartbreaking because there was that one person who mentioned how you know soul destroying that was and traumatic that they started off with these beautiful rugrats colors which is all very very bright sort of almost psychedelic I guess pinks and blues mm. and, and all this kind of thing and that by the end they were just it was just black and white and that mm. somebody even I think if it's if I remember correctly they said something like um somebody critiqued it and said it was like their artwork was behind bars or something like behind because they just absolutely destroyed their mm. not them people around them and then somebody well, else in that group came to tears because they felt validated where they said I had that same experience and they weren't they were in America like a completely different different part of the globe I, I, I mean it's heartbreaking and I just think you know your inner core your creativity is so precious and as neurodivergent people it doesn't have to be vulnerable but it can be vulnerable to you know misunderstanding and just people applying criteria that doesn't fit you as in any other walk of life you know and I think the problem is that creative work is comes from such a personal place you know an aesthetic is it's, it's, a, it's about self-expression, it's about who you are. And if you have that critique, you're having yourself, you're, you know, you're having, your, you're being slayed. Yeah. It's just, it's not okay. Um, and I think I probably, you know, I say I haven't been to art college, I probably wouldn't have survived art college. I've, I've kind of done this myself. I've developed a professional career my way. Um, and you know it is possible but yeah I, I had which is probably why I've created this method where you do do it by yourself because I've had to get away from all that noise I've had to get away from all that potential of somebody putting me off my stroke and then that comes back to because we had this I brought this up the last time we did it as a academy you know mm. art session so however many months ago that was you know is there that neurodivergent or autistic aesthetic because you know Annette has had this with her performance artwork is that it's you know people not understanding the aesthetic of it and things like that mm. and what mm. I found really interesting is that potentially there is there's ways of presenting the neurodivergent or the autistic experience via all sorts of creative means not you know so art is in painting or uh videos or you know anything like that um what's my train of thought oh no so there's a way there's a way of presenting the autistic experience that's an that's a neurotypical aesthetic that those neurotypicals on the receiving end can potentially understand right yes yeah but that's not autistic so I feel that Annette's work for instance the majority of people who will see her work if they're autistic they seem to so the people that we've spoken to after her performances and things like that the autistic people seem to really understand the neurotypical people don't and I find that really interesting because I feel that Annette's work then and not just Annette any other autistic person who's doing their own authentic non- trying to conform to the neurotypical idea of of art for instance so I feel that there's art for neurotypical people that's about aut autism and then I feel that there's art by autistic people for autistic people to see that authentic autistic experience does that make yeah. sense it does make sense I think what we're talking about is the difference between um 
there's sort of like it's it's like almost like a bilingualism like two different languages going on i see it, i always see this in cultural terms um what you're talking about is what neurotypical people can recognize as culture they will accept what they can't recognize as culture they will think is substandard or not interesting or just not very good you know quality there's this kind of um obsessionality with uh product rather than process and excellence as as you know as an idea and i think it takes us really far away from the core of creativity and it's quite interesting because i was trying to write about this quite recently i'm doing a piece of writing with two other people and we're experimenting with writing about um just doing you know the exquisite corpses game have you heard of that i think it's called exquisite corpses where one of you draws a picture of a head and then you turn the page over and then the other person draws school. the body i used to love doing that <laughs> well we're doing it as writing so one person although we're seeing we're seeing what the other person's written so because we're what well, three people are can you co-author three can three people or is it just two people that co something oh no co-author yeah multiple yeah. okay okay so three so three people and each one of us is writing a, a segment and then the other one follows on and it, you can write as a non you know it can be a total non sequitur but it's on a theme it's on a theme and the theme is around um filmmaking actually a neurodivergence and um exactly this thing of critics not getting it <laughs> and um and i've lost my thread now but i was i was trying to write about this thing which is people not being able to see and recognize something when it's not curated in an art way in it's not using the language um and even neurotypical artists suffer with this so it's not it's not just us um and it's brutal because if you if you don't conform to a particular aesthetic then you know your work doesn't doesn't get anywhere so it's it's kind of across the board but i think we fall foul of it much much more often um and i think but it 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 does interest me actually uh, in in terms of my own practice i i think i do speak a neurotypical language i think i do and i don't know if that's because i've learned to do it or because that and, is and but this, how i i work so i'm not because i'm not going to call out you know artists or or you know anybody's act like be clear about who i'm talking about because mm. i don't think that would be fair but I've definitely seen, um, you know, autistic work that has forced itself into that neurotypical sort of aesthetic, if there is one. Um, and this is the thing, it's like we're, we're talking about something you can't really qualify or quantify. Um, but those things mm. that I've seen that have forced themselves into that neurotypical aesthetic make me uncomfortable there's an inauthenticity that makes me really uncomfortable there's something and, that gets in between isn't it and it's so interesting that we're having this conversation because this piece of writing that i've been wrestling with i was trying to express exactly that in terms of film that the more direction and editing there might be when it comes to the lived experience probably the more distance you're creating actually for the viewer in terms of whether they can empathize and understand the neurodivergent lived and experience. and that's where it's like that's why i say is the art no, i don't mean yours i'm talking about no. you know, whatever it is we're looking at but is it that's why i say i like annette stuff or or anybody you know who does things that are quite true to that authenticity of themselves and they're not trying to squeeze into a certain <laughs> aesthetic i feel that that is for the autistic the other autistic people to see themselves to feel 
to feel seen and feel represented. And then there's other work that's about autistic experience, but it's 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 almost like it's trying to translate it into yes, something exactly understandable exactly for that. non-autistic people. And that work makes me uncomfortable. Even if I'm, you know, I go in and I think that I'm going to be seeing something that's by an autistic person for an autistic person, it's almost like my brain just gets it and goes, this this was not meant for us. This is very un this is not authentic. And I'm really now very uncomfortable. Um, and I think that just comes back to a lot of us really struggle with inauthenticity. And the way that I can try and explain that is if anyone's ever seen the Marks and Spencer's adverts, do you know what ones I mean? I think I might have mentioned this to you before. I feel like I have. But the Marks and Spencer's advert, which will say annoying things like, this is not any chicken. This oh, is yeah, Marks I know. Yeah. Spencer's oh. chicken. And this it is made crawl. Exactly. It's so inauthentic it makes you very uncomfortable as an autistic person. So if anyone's in the UK and they know what advert <laughs> I'm talking about. But I get, I get this with, um, and I'm not going to mention any names, but I get this with Radio 1 disc jockeys. I get this with all people who are paid to be chummy. People who are being paid to kind of sound like they're your best mate and you're all having a laugh together. I just, I just can't. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's just so, yeah, it's that inauthenticity. I think we really yeah. don't appreciate it. It just doesn't sit with us no. well at all. No. Um, a few people liked this comment as well. So this is from Sai just saying, um, can art itself be a form of neurodivergent expression? Qu question mark, i.e. all artists are neurodivergent. That's, um, so, I mean, to some extent, because you see a lot of mental health um, differences in the art world. So people with depression or bipolar and so on. So I, I'm wondering if that's um, where he was going with that. I feel somebody else tagged something else as well and said, great question. Oh, it was that one. Yeah, I did, I did grab that. What do you think? Do you think? So sorry, what, what's the question again? <laughs> well, it was, um, I've lost it now because I unpinned it, two seconds. <laughs> Can art itself be a form of neurodivergent expression in the sense that all artists are neurodivergent? I don't think all artists are neurodivergent, but I think there's a hell of a lot of us that are. And that is a nice segue into um, the other reason why I'm doing this project. So we're going, we're doing this, we'll, we'll tick all the boxes by the end of it, Chloe. We're going, we're doing it neurodivergently. Um, <laughs> um, so basically I've come across so many neurodivergent artists and creatives in my in the other side of my work which is the advocacy and mentoring and consultancy and it's kind of tripled or quadrupled since starting neurophototherapy that people are coming forward and disclosing their neurodivergence to me in the arts so I think that there is a very very high proportion of neurodivergent creatives in the arts really high higher than people and and then even imagine exactly and then that makes it really interesting because I talk about that in my training as well that we need to get away from the stereotypes and the myths of uh, autistic people and math savants it's it we're everywhere and there's lots we like are. you say in <laughs> I think I think the particularly arts. so particularly so because because picture this okay so um Arts is a visual, you know, visual arts is a visual environment. Um, so people who may struggle with language and words are going to be attracted. So you're going to get a lot of dyslexic people in the arts who may be very strong visual thinkers. You know, you're going to get a lot of people who are far more comfortable communicating with, with imagery than verbally. You know, you're going to get um, creative and, and original thinkers. So really interestingly, um, I did a little piece of work with um, a, a project called Congress, which was an Arts Council funded project run and created by John Adams through Flow Observatorium. And there might be some people out there, I'm sure there's loads of people out there who know of John Adams, his amazing advocacy 
the neurodivergence and Congress was um, a research project and it was to research the barriers in the arts for neurodivergent people. And so he did this massive survey um, which came back and um, really very kind of a, a very full survey, a huge number of responses, people you know, wrote very openly about their challenges. But what was lovely was they also asked the question about the positive. So what, what enables you, what, what aspect of your neurodivergence that's positive would you like arts organizations to know about and how does your neurodivergence um, help you with your creativity? And that, that, that was the question that I focused on and I was commissioned to make an art response. So I read all the responses to that question and um, it was really, really interesting because our self-perception is that we are naturally creative and that we embody our creativity. It is completely, it's authenticity that drives us, um, but that we are natural originals because we are sort of generally outsiders in a sense. We do think outside the box and I called the my response to the, the survey outside the box because that was the thing that people said over and over again. There were all these patterns in, in the responses that people were saying about themselves and that was like the main thing that came out. And I think you said when we spoke before, um, which I found interesting and sad in sort of equal measure, which was mm. that, for instance, the art world is trying to do better by mm. disabled artists but they haven't got anywhere near that sort of level of understanding and support for neurodivergent disabled artists is that right well i think i think what's different so i'm not sure that is right but i think what's different is that um disability arts which is a movement has been going for a lot longer yeah. And we don't we don't yet know that we have a movement. I think we probably do. There's a huge amount of creative activity going on at grassroots level uh, and and higher up. Um, and it is being talked about. So people are starting to talk about this. Things are moving very quickly, actually, in the arts. But um, certainly disability arts. Uh, has has you know it's just had longer to establish itself it's just more known about um but still struggling still struggling i mean i've recently um started learning more about disability arts and having more contact with other disabled artists which is fantastic um and it's just shocking to learn how long they've been advocating and how far there is still to go um so yeah i would say that the perception is not that the art world is doing better for disabled artists than neuro neurodivergent disabled artists. We're probably on an equal footing. It's just that they're more known about than we are. I think invisible disability is much harder yeah. to communicate about and for people to grasp and understand and, so, like, and yeah. feel, feel, feel confident about. I think a lot of artists as well just, you know, we have a communication challenge and yet we, the onus is on us to communicate about our challenges. It's really difficult, really difficult. Sorry, you wanted to say something. No, no, it's fine. And I've also noticed, um, but I don't necessarily want to highlight them per se, but um, <laughs> uh, one of the, the stories that I said about the heartbreaking stories, um, one of the people that I was thinking of is popped up in the comments as well. So um, they might oh, like to read. We hear you, we hear yeah. you. Well, sadly they missed the beginning so they wouldn't have heard me talk about that. So they can go back and, and listen about okay. um, me wanting to basically, yeah, get that known that that support needs to, or not even necessarily support, but just the recognition. Well, I, of... think, I think that, I mean, that's, that it does. I mean, my project speaks to that because it is about creating something in your own way, in your own right for yourself and you're in control of every aspect of the process. And maybe that's another really good reason why it can be autonomous. To just protect it as a process. And this yeah. is the thing, if we just have this sort of co cookie cutter, you know, way of 
art is supposed to be done in this particular way you can be this creative but within this box which just is very bizarre somebody I can't I, the comments gone now but it was quite early on and it was quite a comment that just said they didn't understand that because surely art is meant to be you know really creative etc cetera, etc cetera. but it does sound like you're being you're you're expected to do to be creative but within these parameters and I just think yeah. we're but then surely people are missing well they are they're missing then whole different aspects of human experience to be they understood are. and then presented <laughs> to the world by doing that because you've got all these fantastic artists who've been you know traumatized because of their rugrats beautiful rugrats colors in, and all that kind of thing and they're being squeezed back into that box and it's like you've now completely lost that very real experience of the world i think if we if we weren't marginalized and put upon i'd feel sorry for them, <laughs> that they're missing out um but i think i think that that is that's the truth and it was really interesting because i was actually part of a panel um of um, disabled artists and advocates quite recently who were saying you know you're missing out this was for the mainstream sector was a panel for um I, I won't say which organization but anyway basically you're missing out if you don't include us and if you don't accommodate us um and actually those very accommodations will make your experience better how boring, how boring is this? I can't tell you how often I'm bored by mainstream cultural products. Revolution. Um, <laughs> there, was a couple of, there was a couple of comments that I quite liked um, or that potentially we could do a little bit of encouragement almost, which was somebody early on said um, that they wish that they could do, uh, could photograph, they wish that they could photograph their dreams. Ooh, and I'm thinking you can. you can I was like I'm sure Sonia will have some suggestions on what you could do oh yes I mean that would be amazing if you really could photograph your dreams wouldn't it but yes I think actually a lot of my work is very dreamlike and a lot of my work is about this kind of oh this sort of liminal space between different levels of perception and consciousness and awakeness and you know you have it's the layers because when i think the, of the work that you've been showing on your instagram recently it's layered there's things so it's got yeah. like you say that kind yeah. of like potentially yeah. and I, quality. Think, I think one of the really brilliant things that i love about collage which is why i'm so dedicated to it this moment um i love that phrase what did you call it what is your particular dedicated? Oh, dedicated rather? interest, as opposed to special interest, it's yeah, a dedicated I love interest. That. One, of, one of the reasons why I'm so dedicated to it is that with collage, you can layer. And that means that you can, so some really the breakthrough collage piece that I made was of um, just the bottom half of myself as a child and the top half of myself as an adult that I'd been cutting up images and suddenly on the cutting mat, these two images came together and they fit together perfectly. And I felt like I was meeting myself in the middle, which was a perfect metaphor for the project, which is I want to go back to myself because the other part of neurophototherapy is this feeling I have that the child knew, the child in me knew what, knew what was what. And I had all of that knocked out of me and I'm having to go back and retrace my steps see yeah and then group. you're touching on the same things again because I again when I said about my growing up autistic I literally talk about that that the young me until I was about nine or so she was assertive she knew what was what we knew we knew we knew before and we it had just, it knocked out of us we knew yeah. and, that's, and then that's, it was just that's mask, what photo, mask, yeah. mask until you're nothing that's what it feels like you're just yeah. this nothing little shell until you can work out your autistic again absolutely so it's very powerful i think this is why photography works certainly for me and for a lot of people is that you're doing it visually 
but also it's a little bit like a ritual and a moment where you've changed something, where you've reconnect, you've literally reconnected yourself. Oh, okay, it's paper, but you've done it. And for me, the powerful bit is putting it out into the world and sharing it and having it seen. For me, I know not everybody would want to do that, but for me, that is brilliant. And then thinking about dreams. So you make the impossible possible with collage. Anything can be superimposed, any image. Uh, and you can source images from all over the place. That's what I was so, thinking. And I, I don't, because I didn't take the person's name when I copied the comment so that I didn't lose it. So if they're still here, I, as soon as- a great question. Well, as soon as I saw that, I just thought, but surely, not surely, but you could, like I say, take all sorts of photos and then put those dreamlike elements in them. And I think that would be lovely to see if that person, I don't know if that person's in the Academy Arts, but you know, that would be lovely to see um, what they come up with. Um, and people are making comments about liking or, or the, the idea of the child us knowing. And I think that's, that's something really important because obviously the majority of people that come to the page are autistic themselves. If there's a few of you that are here that aren't autistic, um, which is very unlikely, probably all autistic, um, you know, they're there potentially because they've got children who are autistic, you know, your children know, you know, fundamentally children do have such, can have such good instincts that just need fostering and making sure that they're safe, all that kind of thing. But we do, you do know, and it just gets so hammered out of you. Um, and it's quite because what, so what you're talking about as well, when you were when, when you were saying about that middle meeting yourself in the middle. So there's the little younger you and the older you on, you know, part of that, because I've over the years, I've had this thing where I will. You also see it on Twitter, like if you could talk to your younger self, what would you say? Things like that. And mine is more about how could I rescue? What would I do? for that young me how can I I don't know not say sorry to her but but do you know what I mean for, for mm. something to sort of um not compensate but I don't know I don't know what I'm trying to say because it's in my brain and I've done it before but it's a thinking thing it's not a thing I've said out loud um and now I'm like you're saying it out loud and it's weird <laughs> um I think I know I I, I I do know what you mean, and I'm trying to think of the visual. The visual equivalent means that then you don't have to come up with the words, you're just doing. In my Which head, me, it's going back and just hugging, even though I don't like hugging, like giving her, well, <laughs> hugging exactly. that small well, me. Well, and that's, just that's, that's how I feel when I make the collage pieces. I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm giving myself a hug. I'm giving my, the young girl a hug that I was, absolutely. And it's very, it's very empowering and it's very, um, well, it's a very warm thing. It's a very warm feeling. And I think that that in itself is very beneficial. You know, I, I, I'm not, as I said earlier on, it's not therapy with a big T, it's therapy with a small T, which means that it's, you know, it's, it's gentle. It's about, you know, um, just working things through, but it can be completely nonverbal if you don't have that, you know, sometimes I do feel very wordless and that's probably why I'm very drawn to, to imagery. So yeah, that's some lovely um, comments. Um, what was, uh, we need to go back and, oh, I've lost it, where is it? We need to go back and tell our inner child, you are perfect, be your beautiful, sparkly, perfect self. Exactly, yeah, yeah that's, yeah. it is. I, if I think of, like I say, small me, I just, I was so, I think without, I, I spoke about this the other day, without feeling that I was being sort of an obnoxious child or anything, I was just very assertive. I just knew what I wanted. I knew instinctively. And I was really quite brave, I think. And then it all just gets absolutely knocked out mm -hmm. of you because I've got images of, um, I was really quite small. I was about three I think, because I'm thinking of when my mum lived in this particular flat, I'm seeing it, and we'd gone and we didn't know, but there'd been a fire in their flat. And, but we got there and we sort of knew something was wrong and the door was open. 
And I went, I'm like, like I say, like three years old. I went ahead of my granddad because I was like, right, what's going on here? You know, <laughs> and that's just who I was yeah. as that small child. And it just got not for my family, you know, family life was difficult for a number of reasons, but not for me being different. That's the mm. one thing that I can say wasn't um, from my family anyway sort of hammered out of me so I still had my stims I sucked my thumb till I was 11 and nobody it was nobody ever said anything of it so there's a fantastic picture of me like I say when I do my growing up autistic I'm like doing this little sort of move and I've got my blanket and I'm like you know <laughs> sucking my thumb and and all this kind of thing but it was just the world the world started to really chip away at all of that until there wasn't much left as a teenager and things this has got very deep on a <laughs> um but yeah um and the other comment that I took which I really liked anyway which I feel like you're kind of doing this anyway but I don't know if you've got plans to do this on a grander scale which is a neurodivergent art gallery or art exhibit you know just of any description you're like I don't know is that <laughs> something you're doing or something <laughs> so a neurodivergent what sorry either art gallery or art exhibit or something just just bringing all that neurodivergent work together it was quite early on and I kind of grabbed the comment and didn't want to lose it um yeah I'm not sure what's being asked really um should we, we, we could we, we create a neurodivergent art exhibit or something it's really interesting I think it's complex. Um, I think that there's loads of things going on. Um, I do think we lack, we lack spaces to show our work and we lack, um, we lack the, you know, the sort of the understanding of it and the framing it, which is where this project comes in. So I think, I think we're at the beginning of all of this. Um, I think we do need it. I'm not yet sure whether this can be rounded up because I think we're quite scattered and I think we're naturally quite I'm, scattered I'm actually, aren't we like, I know like, it's like how would you how would you sheep if, if and, can, and sheep I dog know. like rounding us all up I know. it's almost like it's too glorious to package isn't this it? is true isn't to contain into four and walls that, and is that a neurotypical concept that we have to bring stuff together in a uh, size but, block artopia Art -topia. Artopia. Yeah. Oh yeah. Artopia sounds good. <laughs> I think in an alter doing it in an alternative way in some way would be marvellous. And are there any other key things that you think people really need to know about neurophototherapy or, or any of the that work? It's all on Instagram. So I made a decision early on to um, just share everything on Instagram for now. Some of it will be on my website and um and there will be an on there will be an online exhibition which I think I'm not quite sure what the platform for that will be at the moment but I'll the s posted. underscore that, yeah. that one yeah so I can yeah. I'll pop that back in again I did tag it um quite early on in the talk but we will now and then the website sonyabue.co.uk I think it is yeah um yeah lovely um any other things that we were going to touch on i think was that we did kind of do the neurodivergent aesthetic to some extent uh the trauma of the art world and its impact on neurodivergent artists um sadly um i did put a little thing of playing a part because you said let's not go off on that tangent <laughs> <laughs> i just i just thought oh i've mentioned it and then people won't know what it is and that that's going to be tricky and might they want to know and might you be the better person to explain what do you think I don't know what's been happening with it very recently <laughs> but um yeah I mean the playing apart project yes that was Nicholas Shaughnessy um and a number of other people and it was very very autistic led there was just autistics everywhere it was great as a project so it was um I think it's ongoing isn't it it is they got some extra funding mm. because of the issues with the uh, the lockdown so when did it start 2018 i think and that was um you know large autistic practitioners artists going into schools with um autistic girls 
um, because that's what they got the funding for as much as the team recognised that the gender diversity of our community, certain funders are looking at particular things at the point at this point in time, i.e. autistic women or girls. Um, I so think yeah, they are now, they're, they're now talking about uh, marginalised genders as well. As well, as yeah. Part of it, yeah. Um, well, because you're going to recognise that once you start doing that work, is, isn't it? And then they can, they can yeah. say, well, you know, it came out of it naturally. <laughs> um, but yes, there was autistic people everywhere. It was, you know, autistic steering group. There were autistic people on the um, sort of the academic panel board that were running it and autistic practitioners going in and supporting um, young autistic uh, female or female presenting pupils and just exploring what it meant to be autistic for them. Is that fair to say? I think that's <laughs> fair to say. And also, like me, creating models for creative practice. So trying to find out what um, these pupils enjoyed and how how to co-create kind of like creative workshops um, that would be beneficial that might be then usable in other contexts maybe yeah and to say to, to try so and I give was, them that was, positive um, sense of self yeah so I was I was um working as a, a kind of film artist for the project and while before all the lockdowns, I was going in and filming some of the workshops and getting to know some of the, the young people there and um, just observing autistic teenagers in school. My goodness, that was very powerful. And because I was behind a camera, um, I wasn't actually participating so much. It meant that I really observed and then I observed footage as well. And I really, God, that, that had a very profound effect on me in terms of um, me wanting to start working on my own neurodivergence. That was one of the other things that kind of uh, made me just realise, you know, got to do it. <laughs> you do. We do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I'm trying to think where they're at with the playing a part. I know there was a recent. Did were you sitting on a panel recently as well? Was that with? Yeah. So so um, the, the the playing a part project. It, uh, people might want to see this actually because it's amazing. Um, they got funding as part of the BBC in quarantine commissions, arts in quarantine commissions. They got um, commissioned to work on a five minute animation with an animation company. And it was an opportunity to really inform the public about some of the findings from the research from the project so far. And they made this gorgeous animation called I Feel Different. Yeah, I'm just looking for it. Yeah. I can tag them. And I was a um, creative consultant on that project and spent hours of Zoom time ensconced with a little writing group to come up with the. Um, the form and the, the dialogue and all the rest of it, but it's all based on actually um, pupils' own words and there's even some of the pupils' drawings that the animation is based on. So it's absolutely gorgeous. Is that only, because it's on the BBC, so obviously we have some people in the US, for instance, they won't be able to watch that? They won't be able to watch that, okay. unfortunately, but, 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 um, they might be able to watch the panel discussion, which should be on the Playing Apart website. Okay, and so that, that's... and the, the film was played as part of that. The animation was played. I don't know if that means that they can see the animation there or not. I'm they not sure what happens be with able that. To. Um, do you know where that panel? Where will I find? Is it directly on the Playing Apart website? Is it, it should be. I think they were going to upload. I should it. know I this. I'm the website up... lead from Playing Apart. <laughs> playing a part autistic girls uh, I don't know if it's been uploaded yet Zoe okay I haven't been asked to upload it so <laughs> uh, maybe not it, it probably hasn't been edited yet then maybe okay so as soon as I've got that we can we can um yeah we can share it that's fine okay yeah. um so our final question that we always ask our, our guests um, on Academy is what is your favorite stim? Well, I think I'm a verbal stimmer. I've got to confess, I don't think I can do it on Facebook Live. 
I can't demonstrate, but it involves a lot of tongue rolling. <laughs> Actually, I can tell you a bit because I've tweeted this. Do you remember? Um, so my I have favorite words. And um, my favorite word about a fortnight ago was, and can I say it, antithetical. Anti Listen for the it's sounds, the antithetical. I love the words. Isn't it gorgeous? Moth then, um, <laughs> is my favorite. Moth. Did I not yes, tell you this one? I love so, it. You did, you did. You okay, did. I was going to say, I swear Academy all know this already, which is my favorite was moth on a sloth, <laughs> not moth. <laughs> On a sloth, and it's the. Th it's gorgeous. <laughs> it's gorgeous. So antithetical, and then, oh god, I've forgotten the next favourite one, which had more th th th, which is how I remembered that that must be what it was. Oh, that's sad. I've lost my other favourite word. It's gone. You can't remember the tweet, can you? You retweeted it. Oh, okay, okay. I know what you're talking about now. Okay, right. Let's have a quick look. I love th words. I just, I'll yeah. go up to Louis and I'll just go, <laughs> yes. And he'll just oh, yeah, go we to do me. That. We do that all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he goes to me, yeah. no death. He gets really upset because he's like, no, no death. You're not allowed to die. And I'm like, no, no, I just death. <laughs> <laughs> just the word is so lovely um, to say and do. And I've spoken about this um, a few times, I think now on Academy, which is uh, the time that we were at the um, the arts festival and, and I was tired so I was doing like a little tired stim and you <laughs> recognized it and then we were just there was like four of us just in a little circle doing our own little stims and you were like oh this is nice um, and that was that's just such a lovely memory um, of just a small group of autistic people just doing their autistic thing um, in, a, in a good you know friendly space okay let me find the so the other word um, I say antithetical is quite hard to say. It is very hard to say. And the other one was, <laughs> oh, untethered, untethered. Oh, that was it. Yeah, untethered. Untethered. I love that. And I love the meaning of both of them as well. And they both relate to autism in a way, or my experience, my neurodivergent experience of the moment. I kept saying, well, that would be antithetical <laughs> <laughs> to my lived experience. And then I was going, yes, I have become untethered. <laughs> and then there's just me I just walking it. around going, yes. <laughs> <laughs> moth on a sloth, <laughs> not moth on a sloth. Um, yeah, thank you so much because I will just sit here, keep waffling on about <laughs> random words now. Um, oh, okay, so people are giving us lovely words actually. So we've got onomatopoeia um, as a word, uh, fifth, that's a nice one. Fifth. Um, oh, that's lovely because it's got the word snail in it. The snail and the whale, the snarl and the wall. That's lovely. Oh, gorgeous. Like um, yeah. uh, oh, great. And then Asha, um, I genuinely, genuinely thought I was the only one that says a random word for ages, never knew it was a stim. Absolutely. <laughs> Echolalia is beautiful. And so Echolalia is saying it out loud. Echolasia is doing it in your head, um, which I learned recently. Oh, it's great. And but not like an earworm because earworms are annoying. Whereas echolasia is still having that beautiful regulatory feeling or enjoyment from my head just going moth, not sloth, not moth. <laughs> would you would you be able to do that in a situation where you needed a bit of self soothing? Oh, yeah. echolasia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm. I really like that, Wendy, which is the snail and the whale, just because it's got the word snail as well. Um, somebody else, uh, Amy's sugar plum fairies is their go to curse, which is quite nice. <laughs> I like um, that. <laughs> people like untethered and moth. Asha likes the word moth. Um, I've actually got um, Asha is due to come on. We're going to do a session on the importance of animals for autistic people. Um, and it's just an excuse to show off our giant African land snails because Asha, he also has um, giant African African land snails. Oh. Asha might like my collages of um, ornithology where I um, splice myself together with bird parts. Uh, yes, I've seen those. I really identify with birds. Talking about <laughs> the importance of uh, animals for autistic people. Yeah. 
and I'm thinking I identify with snails and I don't know what that says about me but um, <laughs> the Norwegian word for chickpea is extremely satisfying but they haven't put what the word is so I don't oh, know what that is well, what is it I'm intrigued now yeah I don't know if they put that um oh I can't say that Latin binom- binomials are great Ooh, for binomials binomials but I don't know what but I don't know what they are I know how to say it but I don't know what it is <laughs> Oh, Jenny's put moist plinth. I like plinth for the, th- but the moist word. <laughs> okay, we're just going to be here forever. Um, uh, Gesundheit, uh, favourite German word. Um, Gesundheit, love it. Fantastic, yeah. Um, we're just going to get stuck here just doing all these um, random <laughs> words. Um, oh no, another one which is good. How bibbly, joyful though. I'm glad people wibbly, are liking it. Bibbly, wibbly, bobbly, wobbly, wibbly, bobbly bears. Oh my God, this is so much fun. Um, Okay, right. Thank you everybody so, so much for being here. Um, I have been joined by Sonia Bue. Bue. Um, Yes, yes. You can say it anywhere you want. Oh no, because I had, uh, uh, my birth name was really hard to pronounce. So I changed it because I used to get so frustrated. So I don't like (laughs) mispronouncing other people's names. I think Um, you've got it though for that reason okay good um lovely so this has really really been a great session thank you so much and the lovely words as well that was fun um and lovely lovely people um who are still here so we've got a double bill tomorrow I really booked myself in this week because I had you today (laughs) I've got young um 17 year old Sam Story tomorrow who's talking to Tigger about how do you explain um in a positive way that your child is autistic to them um, and so how he would have liked to have been told or how he was told. Um, and then we've got, um, so that's at seven o'clock. And then at eight o'clock, we've got uh, Dr. Melanie Hayworth from Australia, who's doing the same thing, talking about how do you tell autistic children in a positive way that they're autistic? And they co-wrote a book on that and how you can do that. So that's what we've got tomorrow. So lovely. Thank you, everybody. Amazing. Thank you. Bye. Stop my live, she says. <laughs>